Uh, maybe before we go, uh, I, I should take just a minute or two uh, to introduce the panel to the uh, uh, to the rest of the uh, uh, the audience here, and I'll, I'll probably just ask you to say something about yourselves so that they, they know who you are. Okay, let's we'll start over here. Uh, I'm Jacob Oliver. I'm with uh, NAVAIR through the Channel Lake, their weapon systems division. Uh, got about a year and a half working with flight test operations and propulsion research. Okay, thank you. I'm Ashley Allman. I work for a company called Ocean Air and Space Systems down in Houston. We're a NASA contractor. Um, my group is in charge of sustaining EVA tools and all of our rooms for EVAs. And she's in a lot of Okay, I'm also in Oh, okay, didn't know that. Very right, good. <laughs> Les. Uh, my name is Les Kiocho. I am not an alum, sorry. <laughs> from the uh, University of Texas El Paso and also the University of Houston. Um, I'm with the NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, I've been there uh, over 25 years. Uh, my specialty is on orbit uh, space robotic systems or manipulators, um, although I do know a little bit about space science. So um, I think that's about all, so good luck. Uh, before I begin, uh, the panelists, uh, the printed copies of the, our presentation, there are some minor changes uh, to the final presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing on behalf of, or we'll be discussing a uh, prelim preliminary design review for project orders. Order stands for Orbital Debris Removal System. Let's begin with introductions. I am Patrick Deskin. I am the project manager for Soul Systems Engineering. This is Joanne Ma. She's the assistant project manager. This is Talon Larkin, one of our structural engineers. Scott McCullen, our structural technical manager. Christina Aspie, our, one of our control engineers. Chris Mitchell, another controls engineer. Cole Golightly, our attitude termination and attitude control technical manager. Joseph Talbot, another controls engineer, and Cole Sullivan, a uh, tracking engineer, Austin Leonard, another tracking engineer, and finally, Clayton Jacobs, our tracking and power technical manager. We also have another member who could not be here at the presentation today, and it's Jacob and Nia. He's our uh, power engineer. So, this is a picture of our uh, finalized design after this whole semester of working on it. And as you can see up here is our mock-up. This is a one-to-one -one scale. Uh, you have uh, the different uh, components from each subsystem mounted on uh, our mock-up here. And I'll let the, I'll let the subsystem discuss those uh, more in detail in the presentation. So for our presentation today, we're going to be discussing uh, the system overview, our system description, and each subsystem will be discussing their analyses and trade studies and their conclusions on the requirements that are satisfied for our mission. And then we'll wrap it up uh, with our conclusion. So for system overview, the uh, main mission concept is that in a low Earth orbit, there's a lot of orbital and space debris orbiting the planet. Uh, the reason why this is an issue is that it's increasing. Now, the problem with that is um, the more satellites that are launched, or yeah, more satellites and rockets that are launched, they uh, will have to change their course based on the debris that's in the area. And satellites that are located in LEO, they need to perform multiple invasive maneuvers, which are costly to both the private and government sectors with satellites. And since this is a senior capstone project, we were not able to design to the full mission concept, so we have our DSCO uh, mission. Our DSCO mission, we will demonstrate that it will be able to stabilize itself, that it's able to track and target objects, and that it's able to engage those objects. The benefit from this is that we're able to test the preliminary concept of the design and its feasibility. And also, the uh, benefit is that it's a proven concept towards the fully realized uh, design for this initiative. And our diorama, as Scott will demonstrate as I'm talking, um, as you can see, our system is in front of two shields. The two shields are to protect any personnel that are in the area when the testing is occurring to demonstrate our mission concept. 
and over on the left behind uh, that wall there is our target. We will bring the target in front in the field of view of the system. The system will begin looking for this object and once uh, the system registers that object, it will align itself and it will engage the target. And thank you, Scott. So for our first phase is the stabilization phase. This phase is where the system will autonomously, autonomously stabilize itself uh, using the control system. The next phase is the targeting and tracking phase. Here is where the system will be searching for the target in the area and let us know once it has it in sight. The engagement phase is where the system will align itself with the target and engage the object to uh, simulate it uh, targeting orbital debris. Some of the similar systems that we have are the Centurion Phalanx, and it tracks target, targets and uh, engages uh, targets as well, similar to what our system will do. The uh, difference is, is that our system is not used as a defensive weapon. Another similar system is the Google driverless car. Uh, this detects objects in, in the area, but the difference is that it transports passengers and our system does not. Another system is uh, SACS, which was developed here at Embry-Riddle in the spring of 2013. Uh, the project stabilizes itself, it uses cold gas propulsion, very similar to what our design is. The difference is, is that it does not track or uh, target objects. And now I will pass it off to Joanne Ma to discuss the system description. Thank you, Patrick. Again, my name is Joanne. Now I will be discussing the overall system design. In order to achieve the D-scope mission success, we decided that we our system shall be able to meet the the above nine requirements in order to for it to function well. First, our system shall maintain upright position and shall be dynamically stable throughout the operation. And for tracking and targeting, our system shall be able to determine the position of our target and then align itself with respect to the target. And all communications occurred within the system shall stay self-contained and the overall weight of the system shall stay under 30 pounds. The operation time should be at least two hours consecutively. And for safety concerns, our system shall not cause any harm or damage to any person or a foreign object except for our target. Our budget was given $1,200. And this was uh, given by the College of Engineering at Embry-Riddle to our entire system design. Next, I will talk about system integration. So in order to fulfill the system requirement, our engineers decided that our system will contain an onboard system and offboard computers. As you can see in the middle, the onboard system will consist our tracking subsystem, our power subsystem, our ADAC subsystem, which stands for attitude determination and attitude control subsystem, will also have structure subsystem. Our offboard computers will be the data processing center for the onboard structure. And on the top of the diagram, you can see the shop air connects directly onto the onboard system. This will provide a gas source for our control device in data. On the bottom, you can see spherical air bearing. This is the testing apparatus that was chosen because it can simulate the weightlessness of the satellite in space. And this Testing apparatus, which is the air bearing, will be mounted directly onto the onboard system once it's, it's assembled next semester during detail phase. We will also have a target moving device, which will carry our target and travel around our onboard system. This will simulate our uh, orbits, the, sorry, the space breeze that's orbiting around the satellite in space. And the image on the left, you can see how the spherical air bearing is mounted onto the structure itself. And you can see that the spherical air bearing is bolted onto the front and back of the inner walls of the structure. And the image on the right 
shows how the subsystems are mounted onto the structure itself. And our structure engineers later will discuss more detail. And so software integration will occur between our tracking subsystem and ADAC subsystem. And eight, both tracking and ADAC will use MATLAB pro programming language to process the data and communicate between each other. And finally, our ADAC and our tracking engineers will discuss more detail about that later on. Thanks, so I'll pass it over to Patrick with budget. Thank you, John. So for our mass budget, um, Soul System Engineering, Systems Engineering came up with uh, 30 pounds. Uh, the reason for this number was just based on our initial research before actually fully developing this uh, design. It was uh, greatly influenced by our uh, control system to come up with this 30 pound number. And you can see with the table on my right, uh, the masses were distributed accordingly to the other subsystems. Our cost budget, as Joanne mentioned, we were given $1,200 for our design. Uh, again, you see to your right, the cost was distributed uh, to the other subsystems uh, accordingly. ADAC being the highest because of our research with uh, different control components and attitude components. Last is our uh, power budget. As you can see to the right, um, we determined that our ADAC subsystem will be the one to require uh, the most power, and uh, we we'll have a total of 300 watts to work with. Next, I'll pass it off to Town Market to discuss the structural subsystem. Thank you, Patrick. Again, I'm Town Market, and I'll be talking about the structural subsystem. Um, so, the structural subsystem is defined as the system that will support and protect um, and also integrate all of the necessary subsystems into one package. Um, for the structure, the following requirements were created in order to uh, drive our design. Uh, this one was uh, has to have an adequate amount of strength in order to <coughs> support all the forces put onto the structure by the subsystems. The stability, uh, the structure must uh, be stable when it's placed on the spherical air bearing and left to, with no external forces applied to it. Um, it must be a rigid body as we don't want a deformation during operation. Um, it must be able to mount all the other subsystems on board. And, and once it's built, the components must be uh, easily accessible, so if any modifications are needed, that can occur. Uh, and as a safety concern, the um, structure will be designed without any sharp edges, as we don't want anyone to hurt themselves while operating the structure. structure. Uh, from these requirements, we came up with the overall design of the structure. Uh, as you can see, it is an is an octagon shape. Um, it features a top and bottom platform, um, and these will be connected together using uh, inner and outer walls that will be bolted onto the platforms using the bracket shown here. Um, these walls will then be placed or connected together using cross braces, and these cross braces will be bolted onto the walls using the cross braces here. Now let's talk about how the structure will mount onto the air bearing itself. As you can see here, these two inner walls have a circular bolt pattern placed on them. This is a pre-existing bolt pattern that's already on the air bearing itself. And also, as you can see, the cross brace patterns on these two walls are different than the other sides. We designed it this way in order to provide easier access to the bolts before the air bearing. And the materials that we'll use to build the structure will be uh, carbon fiber and Nomex honeycomb composite and use that to build the, build the top and bottom platforms uh, and also the outer walls. Uh, we chose this to reduce the overall weight of the structure and it will provide rigidity as, as one of our requirements. Um, the other material that we've chosen um, is aluminum 7075 
for the inner walls, the support brackets, and the cross braces, as the aluminum will be easier to work with than the carbon fiber, and it will provide an easier way of mounting the air bearing onto this material. Now I'll talk about how the structure will integrate with the attitude dynamics and attitude control subsystem, also known as ADAC, the targeting and tracking subsystem, the power supply subsystem, and as I had mentioned before, uh, I've said that how the structure will mount onto the air bearing itself. For the ADAC system, uh, it will consist of hoses that will be mounted onto the inside of the outer walls, shown here using uh, bolts. Um, the hoses will go through the center of the outer walls into the solenoids and thrusters, as you can see here. Uh, the solenoids will be mounted onto the outside of the outer wall. Along with that, um, the pressure regulator shown here will be bolted onto the center of the top platform. And the control board for the ADAC system will be mounted onto the inner wall or And for the targeting and tracking subsystem, um, it will consist of a camera that will be mounted on top of one of the solenoids right here, um, a lab jack which will be mounted onto the top platform. Um, again, the control board, which is the same as for the ADAC, will be mounted onto this inner wall. And on the opposing wall, the USB hub will be mounted on this inner wall right here. And the power supply sub subsystem will consist of two LiPo 12,000 XL batteries. They will be placed on opposing sides of each other on the bottom platform, and they will be bolted onto the bottom platform using the bracket shown here. I'll now pass it off to Scott McClellan for the structural analysis. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> As I said, I am Scott McClellan. I'm going over the structural analysis and results. The structural analysis, we did an overall analysis of the entire structure. And then we also identified some potential problem areas and did analyses on those smaller areas to make sure that they would not fail even in the worst case scenario. The materials that we used um, have very high strength properties and good um, modulus elasticities along with good twice on ratios and that's why we, why we chose them, as you can see here. Sorry. As you can see here, these are the material properties. This is how we did the analysis of the overall design. We modeled it in Tia and then applied forces on all of the outer walls laterally and vertically, uh, weight at 15 pounds each. And as you can see, the maximum displacement and the maximum stress are far below our strength and our displacement requirements. And we did analyses on all the other parts. The L bracket analysis for bending what we identified as one of the closest to being closest to failure, so we'd like to point this out. As you can see, we placed a 15 pound load at the center of the outer wall, and this would cause bending on both of the L brackets holding this wall up. And we found the max stress to be 26,000 PSI, and that is including a factor of safety, which gives us a margin of safety <coughs> of 1.82. And we also found the displacement to be 0 0.04 inches. We also did this analysis using CATIA, just to verify the results and see what it says. And we modeled it, and we found that the max displacement was very near the hand calculations, but the max stress was about half of what we found in the hand calculations. This is reasonable since the hand calculations do include a factor of safety and is a conservative estimate of what would happen. We would use the hand calculations number because that is the safer number to use and ensure that the design will not fail. As you can see, the 0 0.04 inches is above our requirement for maximum displacement. However, we still believe it is a good design because this analysis does not include the top supporting brackets of the outer walls. So these, a bracket, these wall brackets are having to support um, twice the amount of weight they would have to, and we did not also account for the resistance to bending that the composite outer walls would have themselves. So even when the worst case scenario, it's only barely above our requirements and we know that it will not fail based on the overall analysis. We did a structural weight analysis to ensure that we were underweight and to give it a uh, moment of inertia and center of gravity numbers that they can use for their control systems. We found that the weight was 13 pounds and these are the moments of inertia. 
And we found that the center of gravity, which is very important for our structural stability, was very near our desired values, meaning that the structure is very symmetrical in design and will be easy for the control system to maintain stability. These are our requirements again. As you can see, we have met all of our requirements in theory. The only one that we cannot test is stability because that would require us to build a structure and put it on the air bearing itself to see what its drift rate would be after a period of time. Obviously, we don't have the actual structure built yet and we can't put it on the air bearing, so this will require testing during the detail phase of our project. And as I mentioned earlier, the max displacement, we feel confident that we will be able to meet that requirement as well as that was a worst case scenario. In conclusion, all of our requirements are met in theory. There may be some modifications necessary as we go through the design. And obviously, in the detail phase of our project, we will have to do further testing of each and every one of the structural components to ensure that they will not fail. And that we will be able to meet all of our requirements, especially for rigidity, which is the most important in our project. I would now like to pass it off to Christina Aspen for the voice. Thank you, Scott. Um, again, my name is Christina Aspie, and next we will be going over the attitude determination and control subsystem. So first, a basic definition of attitude. Attitude is a three-dimensional orientation. We will be finding our orientation using sensors, and we will be using rotational vehicle dynamics in order to control our orientation. So next, I'm going to go over the requirements for our subsystem. So our subsystem shall be able to control roll, pitch, and yaw independently of each other. Uh, with an accuracy of plus or minus five degrees. Um, the sensors will also have an accuracy of plus or minus five degrees and a drift rate of no larger than one degree per minute. And our system shall be able to scan its surroundings until a target is observed and a safety system shall be implemented to make sure that should our system fall, it won't cause any damage to university property or any person. Um, our yaw velocity will reach a speed of between 30 degrees per second and 35 degrees per second, and we shall be able to measure our rotational velocity within 3 degrees per second. Next, I'm going to go over some trade studies. First, I'm going to go over our attitude determination trade study. Our options were pulled gas thrusters or reaction wheels. We decided, or I'm sorry, initial measurement unit, IMU, or um, attitude heading reference system, AHARS. We determined that the AHARS system would be the most desirable due to its higher accuracy and the less coding needed due to internal filtering. And next for our attitude control, our options were cold gas thrusters and reaction wheels. And we determined that the cold gas thrusters would be most desirable for our system due to their higher thrust capability, their lower weight, and their lower building complexity. Our cold gas thruster components will be the Axpot facility air compressor as a gas source, the VI air 90150 as our pressure regulator, our hoses will be made of polyvinyl chloride, and our solenoids will be STC 2S025, and our nozzles will be outsourced aluminum. And next I'm going to go over a couple of governing equations for our propulsion system. The first equation shows our pressure ratio. This then gets plugged in to our thrust equation, which is shown by F. And this gives us the amount of force that we are expected to see out of our nozzles. Um, epsilon shows our nozzle expansion ratio, which <coughs> tells us um, what we need as the size dimensions of our nozzles and also if we're going to have any unwanted separated flow after our nozzles. And our last equation here shows m dot, which is the mass flow rate out of our nozzles. And next I'm going to pass it off to Chris Mitchell to go over the nozzle analysis. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> for our nozzle analysis, we have two different thrusts to meet, a tenth of a pound for a yaw nozzle and about half that for the rolling pitch. We went about designing that. And for our system, we all work off, uh, all the nozzles work off the same internal pressure off that hoop that the structure was uh, defined earlier. And so in order to find two nozzles that worked off this pressure, but still maintain that same thrust, uh, we used isotropic one-dimensional flow to uh, estimate it. Uh, with that, uh, the final design was come up with as uh, the yaw nozzle will converge to a tenth of an inch and then diverge to a 0.129 inch diameter. This will give it a Mach exit of about Mach 2. Uh, whereas roll and pitch will simply exit at Mach 1 and only convert to a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, in order to more to better uh, design the yaw nozzle because the diverging <coughs> the diverging portion will require a uh, length. Yeah. 
So in order to more fully design the yaw nozzle, we uh, came up with a CFD model in order to visualize the flow and uh, determine if the length chosen was correct. Using a 15 degree half angle, this nozzle was developed and uh, uh, analyzed in CFD. Uh, it uses standard atmospheric conditions and the model uses a total energy work method, which includes viscous work, uh, vortice dissipation, and the walls are considered adiabatic and smooth. Uh, this leads to the following results. Uh, these are the flow streamlines and Bachmann work for the flow. As you can see, our max mock is about 1.88, but it slows down while still inside the nozzle. Uh, this is a characteristic of our, our overexpanded flow. But the question of whether it's too overexpanded and uh, will separate is in the next slide, which uh, shows the pressure graph for the nozzle. As you can see, overexpanded air has made its way out of the nozzle and is not separated from the nozzle, showing that there's no flow separation and there won't be any oblique shock waves. Uh, the force found at the end of the simulation, at the end wall, was 0 0.109, which is uh, 0 0.106, which is extremely close to the 0 0.109 found in the isentropic solution. So we consider our simulation valid. And now I'm going to pass it off to Paul for computer analysis. Thank you, Chris. Uh, as he said, I'm Cole Golightly, and I'm going to go over controller analysis. Let's first go over some useful equations. We use quaternions for our target and observed position so that we avoid singularities that we find in Euler angles. Although the singularity will come at 90 degrees pitch, which will not be hit during our testing on the air bearing, we still use quaternions so we design our controller to our mission specs because if we were in space it would hit the 90 degrees pitch. And so then we use the dead band controller to control our system because our solenoids work on on and off where our dead bands only use the positive max torque negative max torque and zero torque, which is the same as the solenoids. And so then we can use the target and observed position to find theta air and use our angular velocity to find theta dot. We plug those into the dead band equation with the M, which is our slope of our dead band region, uh, to find our dead band uh, width D right there. And when the right side of that equation is greater than positive D, we will use negative max torque and when the right side of that equation is less than negative D, we will use positive max torque. And when it is within the region, we will use zero torque to find our desired position. We then simulated our controller using Simulink and MATLAB. We used the dead band controller and the forces from the nozzle analysis you saw before. Looking at our Simulink model, the Q target subsystem, the Q air subsystem, and the controller system, will be what we actually use when we design and build our system and try to control it. The rest are just used to simulate the motion of our satellite on the air bearing. The Q target sublock will bring in the Q observed from the AHARS, and it also bring in the angle from tracking. That's not seen on this diagram because it is actually being simulated within that block here. The Q target will go through three phases, a speed phase to get up to the required speed, then it'll go through a scanning phase to find the object, and then finally it'll bring in angles from the tracking or they'll be simulated so that it can find and target the object. That Q target will be sent into our Q air block with our Q observed from our AHARS to determine our Q air from the equation from the last slide, which will then sent, be sent into the controller block with our M and D values and the angular velocity, which will also come from our AHARS, to determine if we will use max torque uh, negative max torque or zero torque in roll pitch and yaw. This will be done using the dead band equation and it will output a six by one vector that will be on and off, or in this case ones and zeros, for the positive and negative thrusters in each roll pitch and yaw. That will then be sent out to our system, or in this case it will be sent to our torque creator block, which will simulate what torques will be applied onto our system with each thruster being on. That will be sent into our vehicle dynamics block that will accurately depict the motion of our system using the mass moment inertias from the structure system. That will be then sent through a pre-made IMU block from MATLAB that will simulate the drift rate and errors we will see using our ACAR system. And it will also create an animation, which you will see right here. It will first go through the speed phase. It will go about 140 degrees in a little over four seconds. And after that, it will go back into the scanning phase, as you see here. It will go between plus and minus 90 degrees. This is our testing field that we will have on the air bearing, so it will stay between those two. And so it, the whole time through the mission, the roll and pitch will be trying to stay stable at zero degrees roll and pitch. You can see the <coughs> air bearing right here as a reference to the roll and pitch diameter. So it will do a couple times of the scanning, and then you will see after, the next time this comes around, an object will be placed in, and it will start moving to simulate our moving object. And as you can see, 
here, this object is there, and it'll start moving. Our system will catch up to it and then lock on, and it'll continue to be focused on the object until the object is removed using the system. And then after that, as you see, it'll go back into its scanning phase and then do this continuously until another object is placed in. It will target that object, remove the object, and then go back into the scanning phase. So from this simulation, we can come up with stability graphs. The stability graphs only show the speed phase, then the scanning phase, and then when the object is placed in, it only stays at that position so that we can see the stability in the yaw. As you can see, the roll and pitch stay between the plus or minus five degrees that are desired through the whole time. The yaw, the scanning stays between the plus or minus 90 degrees, and then once the object is met, it stays between the red lines, which simulate the plus or minus five degrees. These bottom graphs show the how many times each roll and pitch and yaw are fired. You can see yaw has a lot more firings. This is because of the speed phase where it's almost constantly firing to get up to speed. And then the scanning phase going between plus or minus 90 degrees also costs, costs a lot of firings. And then when you get to the reaching and stability around the target, the firings become a lot less. From these stability graphs, we can find the results that our max yaw velocity is 33.6 degrees per second, which is within our requirements. As you saw from the graphs, all, both, all three, roll, pitch, and yaw, stay within the plus or minus five degrees. And the number of firings we see through this 100 second test are 38 in roll, 25 in pitch, and 541 in yaw, showing that yaw has the most firings throughout our test. And now I'm going to pass it off to Joe Talbot to talk about ADAC integration. Thank you, Cole. So as Cole said, my name is Joe Talbot. I'll be talking about ADAC integration. The first part of integration we'll be talking about is data flow. The data from the ARs unit will be sent to the computer via USB, where it will then be processed by the controller. The data after processed by the controller will be output uh, through the lab jack to the solenoids in the form of on-off signals for each solenoid. Next, I'm going to talk about electrical level integration. The ARs and lab jack will both be powered via the computer, and each solenoid will also be better powered by the batteries. Next, I'm going to talk about the the mechanical level integration. The nozzles will be connected to the solenoid and positioned correctly via elbows. The solenoids will be connected to the hose hoop via T connectors and hosing. The hose hoop will be connected to the pressure regulator via a T connector and hosing. And the pressure regulator will be connected to the gas source via a series of fittings and hosing. Finally, I'm going to talk about the conclusion for the ADAC subsystem. As you can see in this table, all of our requirements are predicted to be met. Some of these requirements, such as the drip rate and accuracy of the ARs, are straight off the spec sheet and will be met as long as we purchase the predicted ARs unit. And I'm going to pass it off to Cole Sullivan with tracking. <coughs> Thank you, Joe. My name is Cole Sullivan. I'm going to be talking about the uh, <coughs> tracking subsystem. The tracking subsystem is. Uh, responsible for determining the necessary change in attitude in order to target the object and communicating that uh, angle to the, uh, to the ADAC subsystem. It also needs to uh, collect data that can be used to determine the uh, position and velocity of the object. The tracking subsystem has uh, requirements for Angular, angular measurement precision and maximum uh, angular rate, range measurement precision and maximum range measurement, um, velocity measurement precision, cost, mass, and power. It's predicted to meet all of these requirements except uh, velocity will need to be experimentally determined once we um, actually test it in the detail phase. Uh, it will depend on the capability of the computing hardware. The result of our trade studies for this system was to use a camera as the sensing architecture. Uh, the angle can be determined uh, based on the location of the target in the frame, and the range can be determined based on the uh, known diameter and um, uh, the pixel uh, width. For uh, the processing architecture, MATLAB was chosen along with the parallel toolbox to improve processing speed and machine vision toolbox to uh, allow for the image processing. This is the camera we will be using. It's a Logitech C920 webcam. 
it has a resolution of 360B that 1080p and costs about uh, $100. That lab will not cost anything because it's provided by the university. The camera has a field of view of 78 degrees. Uh, so it's angular precision uh, at a resolution of 360p will be about 0.1 degrees, which uh, is within our uh, requirement. So the way we will be calculating range is with a known diameter uh, and uh, using the pixel width of the our target in the image. That is not uh, how it would be in an actual spacecraft, but for our scaled down uh, version, uh, this was considered acceptable as we can still um, calculate the necessary change in attitude without knowing the range of the object of un unknown diameter. The downside to this method is that the precision decreases quickly with range. For example, at a resolution of 1080p and a 6 inch target, um, it will meet the range requirement of 0.4 inches up to about 6 feet. Beyond that, you can see the data points get uh, further apart. It can measure out beyond uh, 20 feet, um, but the precision, which is which corresponds to the magnitude of the slope of these curves, uh, is reduced at that range. Now we'll, I will pass it up to Austin Leonard, who will continue to talk about tracking system. Thank you, Paul. My name is Austin Leonard. I'll be continuing the tracking analysis. So a large part of the real-time tracking is going to be the image processing, and for the image processing, we're going to need to do the processing in a timely fashion. In order for this to happen, we need a, uh, we decided to use a PNG format, using a, which uses a 8-bit unsigned integer to assign pixel intensity between 0 and 256. <laughs> and for our spatial resolution, we'll be utilizing a 680 by 480 resolution, which is more than enough to identify an object and a temporal resolution, or the Logitech webcam has a max temporal resolution of 30 frames per second, which would be more than enough for a real-time tracking. And for object identification, we decided to use a threshold method, which is an efficient way of determining the, the pixel intensity in an image. By, by choosing a suitable T, black and white can be distinguished in the image. And using the center of the region, and a image, or the sequence of images, a velocity can be determined and an attitude. And this data will be sent to the ADAC system. So for object identification, the initial process will to be identify an object entering into the environment, and then the next sy system will identify or send the controls, or send data to the control system. And the endpoint perspective model is another method of determining attitude. The corner cube, corner cube reflectors are affixed to the object and used to determine the attitude of an object. This is a representation of how our tracking will be integrated. MATLAB will be utilized for our data processing. A lab track will be used to send the data, and a user can enter a, a user will interface with a PC. The tracking integration. The user can start and stop the tracking, and this will, uh, the image will be acquired from a live webcam, and then continue on, sent on to the control system. In theory, our requirements have been met. We still need to do more testing for a velocity measurement, but this has been, or this has been <coughs> experimentally validated. Next, Jacob will talk to you about, or Clayton will talk to you about the new power subsystem. All right, thank you, Austin. Again, my name is Clayton Jacobs, and I am the technical manager for the power and tracking subsystems. So first off, the definition of the power subsystem is simply to provide the necessary power for the electrical systems within our system. Requirements for the power subsystem include the ability to regulate and distribute power at the required current and voltage ratings, to uh, provide the infrastructure for the switching of the relays on and off, or excuse me, the solenoids on and off, 
and in order to provide a large enough capacity to enable the system to perform for long-term periods. A trade study was conducted for the power source of our system. Ultimately, a 12,000 milliamp hour light, uh, lithium polymer battery was selected. This battery had a relatively high capacity, high voltage, and also a uh, low cost as it will be donated uh, to our available as a donation through one of our team members. Uh, the high voltage of the battery will need to be regulated down to a lower voltage for the solenoids. Uh, this regulator was selected. It uses a buck topology to step down the voltage. And the input and output specifications of this regulator are within the values of both the battery and the relay which it will be driving. We selected a relay to enable the triggering or the firing of the solenoids for the ADAC subsystem. This will be enabled through a low level 3.3 volt TTL logic line uh, coming from the attached lab jack. And uh, this system has relatively low power requirements and a fast switching speed to enable the firing of the thrusters. Uh, above, the image above is a functional overview of what the uh, power subsystem may look like. It consists of the batteries, the regulators, the relays, and lastly, these connect to the solenoids. As for power analysis, uh, we determined that the maximum current required of the solenoids is within the range of the maximum current of the relays and the regulator. Uh, continued power analysis showed that when two of the 12,000 milliamp hour batteries are put in parallel, we have uh, just above uh, 500 watt hours of power available. And when this capacity is combined with the uh, approximately 90 watts consumed of the solenoids, including a 10% margin of safety, that the system could operate for upward uh, nearly six hours. Uh, in conclusion, we believe that all of the requirements for the power subsystem will be met. I'll hand this off again to Patrick Deskin. Thank you, Clayton. <clears throat> to wrap everything up for our overall design, our structure will be an octagon shape consisting of carbon fiber and Novex honeycomb, and uh, 775 aluminum. Our ADAC system will consist of cold gas thrusters that will utilize the AxFab shop air. They will be regulated with the VI air 90150 pressure regulator. We'll be using PVC hoses to connect to the STC 2S025 solenoids and to the pre-made aluminum nozzles. And the control system will be processed through a MATLAB programming language for their algorithm. Tracking, they'll use the Logitech webcam in order to track our foreign object, and they will also use the MATLAB programming language for their uh, tracking algorithm. And for our power, we'll be using the two ba batteries, the 12,000 uh, XF. In theory, after all the subsystem analyses, we have met all of our requirements. Uh, with debris tracking, uh, or debris targeting, we need to test this still uh, in order to see if our ADAC subsystem and our tracking subsystem can communicate with, with each other properly. And also the safety for personnel and objects also requires testing to ensure that it causes no harm to any people or objects. So the total hours we accumulated out of the semester was 1,283 hours. As you can see from our pie chart here, um, our engineering management, engineering administration, and professional development was distributed uh, fairly evenly. So we, uh, as a team, we believe our time was spent efficiently in these areas. The lessons learned from this project is to always follow formatting to avoid uh, the hours of editing for papers and presentations and multiple proofreads are necessary outside of our team specifically because when you have fresh eyes on a document they if we can make it clearer to uh, other people who would choose to read our documents and also we learn to distribute distribute work evenly as possible so that no one is stressed out or gets too over, overworked and also strong team dynamics are the key to a successful project I can't emphasize that enough. I would also like to acknowledge all these professors and faculty members here at Embry Riddle. They helped us to achieve our uh, mission complete or project completion, 
and we could not have done it without their help and expertise. Well, that concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions? materials 
and we went through carbon fibers over honeycomb, we went through aluminum, wood, ABS plastic, and uh, we created our own uh, measurements for that okay. in order to develop our decision matrix. Okay, cool. Well, that's great. Uh, I know that you guys point out trace studies and then obviously it's in the back of the truck. Um, let's see, a couple more. Um, just a comment when you when you present uh, moments of inertia, always specify that the products of inertia are either negative or positive, positively based. They're either positive angles or negative angles. Because that can bite you when you're working with equations you have the wrong well, signs on the off-axis terms. So just a comment. Um, let's see, map map speed. You perform a complete integrated stem of your vehicle with the subsystems all running under map map, correct? Okay. On the flip side, I heard a lot about you'll be using map map on real time tracking and processing, basically it has the determination process. Is it fast enough to give you guys what you need for those for those two um, names? Was it one of the classes that we take the experimental space system? And was that we actually used a you know, lab programming software to do real time to add to the generation? Parallel to that is how we're going to adjust that. It would be it runs off a multi core processor and you can run each task on a separate GPU. Okay. So what kind of frequencies are you planning to run your attitude control system? Uh, that's at 10 hertz. 10 hertz? Okay, so at 10 hertz, you can make you know, whatever computing platform running MATLAB with all this various software. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that when you guys get into the detail. <laughs> I'm interested to see how that pans out. Okay, last, last comment, real quick. Um, lessons learned. I didn't see the word communication, and that's usually the one that I see when I get to like lessons learned. Well, I guess that would fall under a team. team I understand. But you didn't call it out specifically. It was just a little very clear. That tells me your group, you guys didn't have any issues other than clothes. <laughs> well, every group, <laughs> every group has issues, but I'm glad to be working with this one. Okay, it's just a minute. the project done. Obviously, communication isn't perfect because we're human beings, sure. but uh, we were able to communicate relatively effectively as to what we needed for each individual subsystem or a group overall. That wasn't our major issue. Right. Uh, team dynamics were more of a problem with us than Okay. Well, and, and the reason I bring this up is I look up here and I see a large group. So the first thing that pops into my mind is communication. As a matter of fact, communication, communication, communication. It's always a challenge. It's a difficult challenge. So, I'm glad to hear that team dynamics and everything worked out. Yes. We, again, you guys did a really good job. I'm really pleased to see this. I hope to be back for your team. So I'll pass them on to Ashley. Thank you. All right. Yeah, good job, you guys. Um, so we're going to go tracking. <laughs> this is kind of your, um, this is your main mission goal, right? Um, I'm seeing a little, a little bit of uh, a lacking in the tracking area, especially in the redundant scene, excuse me. So from what I understand, you have one camera, and it's mounted on one side, and you're going to continuously move the aircraft until, or get it in rotation, um, until you find an object, and then you're going to uh, use your solenoids to stop you know, the, the rotation of your spacecraft. Why not? Put uh, like a PTZ camera. What kind of a study did you guys do when, when deciding on which components to use here? It was a combination of simplicity and then prior experience that we have. Uh, I'll have Austin talk a little bit about the class. We have a class here on campus that uh, relates the optical sensing. As Patrick mentioned earlier, experimental space system, we use a webcam to determine the horizon and then determine our attitude from there. So that's the only reason we chose the webcam. We already have a lot of experience in the MATLAB program, programming side of it. And then as well, the other systems that we analyzed required a lot more work for that we had no experience with. We looked at a couple other things like a LiDAR sensor or I think another type of optical sensor, but it was either cost 
or a lack of some kind of support material that would allow us to integrate that into MATLAB or some kind of environment that we had experience with and then apply it to the project. Okay. Because um, what I see with this is if uh, your camera goes down, you're completely useless. <laughs> no matter how good your propulsion system is or your other systems, that's, that's your whole mission is to track these objects, right? Um, so that's something that, that I would recommend you consider as you go into detail, picking um, up your system, maybe considering that multiple cameras. Um, because you can still use you know, what you guys know of that and your current resources to implement something. Um, did you consider a different location for your camera? Not really. We just chose an arbitrary location for now until the testing phase, and then, then we'll kind of go from there and analysis or analysis from there. Ideally, the camera would be placed on the same plane that the, that the foreign object would be so that there was no uh, type of error in the horizontal or vertical dimensions. And this is in D-scope. Right. right. So you guys are all trying to be looking in the direction. In the actual system, there would be plans to have multiple detection systems in various directions, so to be able to keep track of everything. Mm -hmm. But in our D-scope, we decided to put it on the front of the system and use that as, that's why we have a scanning phase to track for it. And we decided um, on top of the solenoid because that's as close to the center as we can get it. So that it would, it most accurately represents um, on the plane that we're working in. On, on the overall mission, we actually plan to use a, a steerable radar system. But of course, that's not something we can implement in the D-scope model, so we decided to go with optical. Okay, did you guys consider mounting it, or you guys have a regulator? Kind of We based um, our main mission off of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is very precise and pointing in a certain area for a long time. And with the system of having to be able to target small debris in space, it required an extreme amount of precision. So the Hubble Space Telescope, it doesn't move the telescope mirror lens at all. It moves the entire satellite in order to point in a specific direction. So in order to simulate that, we wanted to build it the same way, that the entire system has to move in order to point because in space we would need that kind of precision. And so it's a difficult to track an object, but it's also a right? Yes, and obviously um, it's, uh, the actual mission would be a, a very difficult but feasible project, and our D-scope has to, with the resources and the know how that we have, Absolutely. trying to represent the best position. sensors on these multiple faces, uh, the, the cost for that system got too high, and we didn't believe we'd be able to integrate that into that lab, and so when we went to the uh, optical system, we decided to keep the structure as is. So that explains the variety of faces that you see and, and the surface area of those faces. Okay. And, and you guys said that you looked at, um, as a historical project, you looked at SACS. Did you look at PATS from Dr. Neal's first detail class, because it, it also did uh, tracking out to my group. <laughs> 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 but I mean, it, 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 it used uh, solar cells to track the light source. Okay. So, um, and since it was a tracking, uh, a tracking mission, that's what it was. 
I don't think I have any really specific questions. You guys can go through that. Probably two questions, and you can keep it to that. That's okay. That's about all I have. Okay. <laughs> uh, just yeah, very very good job. A uh, lot of effort, a lot of detail. Uh, I got a lot of nitpicky things to go to, too, but we don't have time for that. Maybe except for the one. Why are you guys using English units? Your space, it's metric territory. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's the only country that I've been on the to use a unit, we actually made a decision as a team to use one unit system instead of trying to convert between the two, so that we would all be consistent and we'd all know what we were talking about when building and placing all of our subsystems off of the structure. It was for convenience on Earth. And then, uh, just because we were talking about the control system and your plan for rotating spacecraft, uh, just because we're talking space and you're so energy limited up there, I don't think you should be looking at you know just swinging back and forth. I think if you're going to do something like that, and I understand the design reason why, you should probably just look at doing a continuous spin until you walk on something and then you so. Yes. So the re that was our uh, that's the design board that was actually a mission in space, but due to our testing that we only had the 180 degree field is why we just kept it in between the 180 degree field so that it's no it's not the removal system is never facing away from where the object is going to be and can face towards either a person or some kind of object and possibly cause damage. So okay. that's the only reason it goes back and forth. If it was an actual mission space, it would just rotate around. Okay. And I'm not trying to point out any fixes or that. I'm just trying to put in as much in the short amount of time as possible. Uh, the last main thing I wanted to discuss was on slide 21, when you're talking about your power budget. Like you're going through your mass budget and your cost budget for everything else, um, why are you only looking at a power budget for your ADC and your reserve systems? Because you've clearly shown on the tracking system that you also have a power draw. Speaking from the tracking target, you have to get to you. That's correct. The camera, the lab jack interface, and the USB hub uh, will all be powered through an umbilical that leads back to the offboard computers. So the power is sourced from those computers, and because the system itself didn't have to provide that power like in the battery, we decided not to include that in the budget. But that is a power draw, and we're assuming that the PC that it's connected to will be able to source the power for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would, I would probably include that just with an asterisk. Okay. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you.